So in Walter Benjamin's The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction from 1936, he introduces his now famous concept of aura, which he describes as the unique presence of a work of art, of a historical or of a natural object. We may think, he says, that an object has to be close by if we are to experience its aura, but paradoxically, Benjamin defines aura as the unique phenomenon of a distance. He explains that if while resting on a summer afternoon, you follow with your eyes a mountain range on the horizon or a branch which casts its shadow over you, you experience the aura of those mountains, of that branch. Similarly, writes Benjamin, the painter maintains in his work a natural distance from reality. This respect for distance common to both natural perception and painting is overturned by the new technologies of mass reproduction, particularly photography and film. The camera can be anywhere and with its superhuman vision, it can obtain a close-up of any object. These close-ups, writes Benjamin, satisfy the desire of the masses to bring things closer, spatially and humanly, to get hold of an object at very close range, which along with disregarding the scale, the unique locations of the object are discarded as well. Moving to Virilio, who similarly who similarly uses the concept of distance to understand the effects of telecommunication and telepresence in 92. Um, he speaks about these uh, technologies and how they collapse physical distances, uprooting the familiar patterns of perception which ground our culture and politics. He introduces terms um, like small optics and big optics to underline the dramatic nature of this change where small optics are based on geomet geometric perspective shared by human vision, painting and film and involve distinctions between near and far, between object and horizon. Big objects are the real-time electronic transmissions of information, the active optics of time passing at the speed of light, the live feeds of information that read and process simultaneously. Virilio says that if information from any point can be transmitted with the same speed, the concepts of near and far, horizon, distance, and space itself no longer have any meaning. So if for Benjamin, the industrial age displaced every object from its original setting, for Virilio, post-industrial age eliminates the dimension of space altogether. For Benjamin, film still represented an alien presence Whereas for Virilio, it became part of our human nature, the continuation of our natural sight. And I just want to touch quickly on what Leif Minovic describes as a more recent media transition around the means of reproduction or communication technology as distancing or zooming mechanisms, which he calls Web 2.0, and describes the shift from messages to platforms and now from platforms to aggregators. And these aggregators create a new media paradigm exploring diversities of singularities, not through hierarchies and categories, but rather through relations, transitions and sequences, while moving from the singular to the plural, from the close to the distance. And of course, bringing to question the way that this data is now used as currency and the surveillance and tracking that it has allowed. So moving on to the bed. I'd like to speak a bit about maybe a more tangible collapse of distance and closeness that I'm sure we're all experiencing in different ways as we move on to online teaching, learning and working. So in a recent online tutorial for our master's studio, I realized that one of the students was attending the tutorial from his bed, which maybe some of you are doing today. So my first reaction was that this was inappropriate for a studio session. But then I couldn't stop thinking about it and thinking that we're all being led into our students and each other's private domestic lives through these tight Zoom windows. During another tutorial, um, my partner came into the kitchen where I was stationed to make a coffee and the students heard and started laughing and so I had to introduce him and it felt like an intimate sharing of private space. So Beatrice Kalamina writes about the bed to explore the role of the bed in the architecture of the digital age. In what is now a very conservative estimate, 
The Wall Street Journal reported in 2012 that 80% of young New York City professionals work regularly from bed. So now we can only imagine how millions of dispersed beds are taking over from concentrated office buildings. Kalamina says, the boudoir is defeating the tower. Networked electronic technologies have removed any limit to what can be done in bed. She further goes on to describe bed as an architecture. And um, what is the architecture of this new space and time? What is the nature of this new interior? In this new architecture, she says that night and day, work and play are no longer differentiated and we are permanently under surveillance even as we sleep in the control booth. So this brings us to the question of surveillance. And um, we've spoken about film, telecommunication systems, and the bed as ideas that collapse distance and closeness, public and private. And these ideas are all exasperated by the coronavirus outbreak and the moment of pandemic that we find ourselves in. In a recent interview, Yuval Harari, was speaking about this um, accelerated moment of surveillance. And he said that the coronavirus outbreak could be a watershed event in the history of surveillance. The moment when surveillance goes under the skin, testing body temperature, blood pressure, and so on. So this brings me to speak about our studio, Cities Under Surveillance, and the rest of the slides are student work. Um, so, Dossier Cities Under Surveillance, our studio, explores the systems of control that govern, regulate and mediate urban public space. Driven by capital and political agendas, hypersecuritization has blurred dominant definitions of what public means. The studio explores how contemporary public space is contested. It is controlled by concealed and exposed authorities from a piece of legislation to a heat map which measures densities of bodies. So our site becomes these larger systems of control that detach themselves from geographic location. Um, in Shoshana Zuboff's The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, she explains that the body is simply a set of coordinates in time and space where sensation and action are translated as data. All things animate and inanimate share the same existential status in this blended confection, each reborn as an objective and measurable, indexable, browsable, searchable it. So this elusive nature of surveillance detaches public space solely from the bounds of geographical location to be read in relation to broader systems of control that transcend virtual, physical and psychological making public space a territorial question. And I'd like to just end with a clip from um, some of our past students' projects. This is Dana and Freya, who came to Joburg with us last year. And the title of their project is Or Any If May, looking at borders and legislation. So this project criticizes the legislation of Sydney's King Cross area that has put temporal restrictions on the city, namely the New South Wales lockout laws introduced in 2014. The project uses texts of legislation to reveal the malleability of the written word that the authority take advantage of and manifest on the physicality of the city. In the video, we see the machine designed to reread and rewrite the invisible border of the city enforced by legislation. Dana and Freya occupy the border with the machine, leaving a line of chalk and printing out the ambiguous words of the text that allow for misreadings, slippages and control over the city. The words being or, any, if, may. The structure and form of legislation is written in a way that creates distance from the public. When Dana and Freya occupy the outline of the border, they hold a close relationship with the impact of the written word and the boundary between public and private, distance and closeness, which no longer exist. 